Hi, and welcome to Axelbank Reports History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, the co editor of Mourning the Presidents Loss and Legacy in American Culture. She is the author of one previous book, The Cabinet, on George Washington's cabinet and is at work on a new book on John Adams. She's also a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University, and she lectures for George Washington University. She's also active in the peace world, pieces. She writes pieces for a number of publications. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Trevinsky. You are indeed a friend of mine and a friend of the show now. This is your second appearance. It's good to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me back. It's so fun to be here with you. It is indeed. Before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash Axelbank History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. There is one thing we all have in common, and that is even with presidents, one day we will die and we assume be mourned. Presidents are mourned by many someones to the point where Dr. Trevinsky and her co-editor, Matthew Costello, argue that we can learn not only about the dead president from all that mourning, but about our culture. So, Dr. Trevinsky, let's start at the beginning. What can we learn about America when we compare George Washington's modest funeral with the gigantic memorial that looms over everything in the city that bears his name? Well, that's a great place to start. And as you noted, When presidents die, the reaction by the American people says an awful lot about where the nation is at that moment, what Americans are concerned about, what they prioritize, what they value, and what they fear. And Washington is very much a good example of that process. So one of the things that I think Washington's death reminds us is that once we're gone, we kind of lose control over what happens after us. And Washington is, that's true for him too, even though he was the father of the country and the probably the most famous man in the world. So Washington died. He wanted a very simple family service that was private and at home. And compared to the services that came later and the state funerals that we've seen in the 20th century, his was very modest, but it was not what he planned. People from Alexandria, local communities, family, friends, neighbors, They all came and demanded to play a role in this service. And then the nation staged over 400 mock funerals across the country so that people could participate in the mourning rituals. And the author of this this chapter, Mary Thompson, was a historian at Mount Vernon for decades and has forgotten more about Washington than anyone else will ever know in her lifetime. And she (laughs) details... You know, how each of these funerals sort of, she doesn't talk about all 400, that would make for a very long chapter, but um, (laughs) she details how these chapters, or excuse me, how these funerals are an opportunity for Americans to mourn because they are terrified. Because most Americans at this point didn't know what it was like to have an independent nation without Washington around. And so even once he was gone from office, he was this symbolic figure. He was a safety blanket because he was the father of the nation. And they were desperate to cling on to that as long as possible. And so I think to a certain extent, the Washington Monument, which was proposed right after he died and sort of they started the planning, even if it wasn't finished for a very long time, demonstrates this desperation to have him lingering on in the background sort of as a safety pillar, if you will, to help keep the nation going. He set many precedents in life, and you've written about many of them, certainly when it comes to the American presidency. Um, What precedents did he set in death? And I guess, is that the precedent that presidents would always be mourned in a way that would distract from the way they live their lives and ran their presidencies? Well, I think he he set a couple of important precedents when it comes to to mourning. One, a president can lay their best laid plans, but then, of course, there are certain things that are beyond their control. Their families and their heirs really do shape what the mourning process is like once they're gone and the first iteration of their legacy. Washington's funeral was also a pretty good marker that for at least the next 
150 years, only certain people's mourning thoughts and concerns were taken as important or were included in the legacy process. So when Washington died, he did emancipate the over 100 individuals he owned in his will. But most of the descriptions of his death, of the funeral, of what it meant to go to Mount Vernon or race, the fact that those people were present. So that was something that I think continued really up until perhaps the civil rights movement. Um, And then, of course, how people responded demonstrated what was going on in the nation. And and while Washington didn't necessarily establish that precedent, precedent actively, it certainly did establish a pattern for what would come later. We're going to be fighting over that those two words there, precedent and president. We have to get those right during bit this. Bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> um, what, is, uh, what is it about the job description of the president, both the official job description and the unofficial job description, that makes us feel as though we are mourning someone who we know? Well, here, that's a little bit of a tricky question, because on one hand, the president is the only person that represents all Americans, at least in theory, the only person that all Americans who are able to vote can vote for. And the president is the most powerful person in the world. It's this huge office. It's certainly the most visible figure. So generally much more visible than an average congressperson. Uh, tends to be much more visible and accessible than a Supreme Court justice, which of course is not elected. And so there is a tangible feeling that Americans kind of own a piece of their president or the president belongs to them. And yet the part that I think is a little bit inconsistent is once presidents leave office, they're supposed to go back to being average citizens. Now they might have secret service protection and <laughs> they probably have nice homes and you know they they probably charge a pretty hefty speaking rate, but they're still in theory supposed to be average citizens. And so in a republic, an average citizen would not necessarily be celebrated with the state funeral level that we see. That tends to look much more like a monarchy. And in fact, those individuals, if you watched the most recent presidential funeral, which was George H.W. Bush's, and you watched Queen Elizabeth's funeral, there are a lot of parallels there. And so that is something I think we have to think about as Americans is, is that appropriate? Is that what we want? And if not, how can we maybe better commemorate their legacy and their service without tiptoeing into glorifying them? This is sort of the unsayable part of this episode, so I'll just say it. Um, we're taping this Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, unfortunately, former President Carter has been placed in hospice care. By the time this episode airs in six days, that could the situation could be different. Um, I, I do want to ask, uh, you brought up the fact that these presidents often go back to living um, – they're supposed to go back to living normal lives. Jimmy Carter may be the only one who did go back to living a relatively normal life, even though he probably didn't have to go back and sell, you know, car insurance or, or, you know, work in the local hardware store. But um, he did build houses, which is impressive. Um, But what are you expecting from President Carter's, for President Carter's Carter's arrangements, given that he is a president who didn't go about living this kind of high flying life that some of them live with the mansions and the high speaking fees and all the rest? Yeah, he certainly represents more of the citizen president model that was, I think, envisioned in the 18th and 19th centuries. We don't know necessarily what all of the funeral plans will be. I watched an interview with him when I think he was talking about this subject in like the 1990s, because the minute you become president, you have to have a funeral plan, because if something were to happen while you were in office, there has to be some sort of provision. And uh, so he was kind of making jokes about how people were writing about this plan and like they were so uncomfortable writing that he was going to die that they would say when he was like no longer involved in the same way. And so he was like making these jokes and it's it's such a great interview. If you guys can find it on C-SPAN, it's just, it's so worth watching because I think it really shows who he was. And he sort of alluded that there would be some elements that he would replicate from previous funerals. So it's not unusual at this point for presidents to lie in state in the Capitol. It's not unusual for there to be a service at the National Cathedral and then a more local service for family and friends, whether it be in Texas or in Georgia, depending on where the president is from. But I do suspect that there it, there will be elements that are much more simple and much more Carter-like. So he has expressed a wish to be 
buried in Plains, Georgia. He's expressed a wish to be buried at his home rather than his presidential library, which is a little bit more of a simple little R Republican concept. Um, I suspect that the service in Georgia would be simple. It would include a lot of the church practices and the community and the music that he celebrated and was so integrally involved in on Sunday school until I think just a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So there are certainly elements that I think would be much more humble and much more Carter-like than some of the previous ceremonies we have seen. Uh, For anybody out there who has not been to the Carter Center and Carter Library, highly recommended. It's a wonderful place to visit for any history nerd, any presidential history buff. It's really a wonderful place filled with amazing treasures from President Carter's life. Um, All right. So as for the book itself, and we're going to get back to the presidents, but the book itself When and how did you realize that we had spent enough time on the lives of presidents, but not on the deaths of presidents? So Matthew and I had this conversation shortly after George H.W. Bush died, where we realized that a lot of the things people were saying about Bush weren't necessarily a whole lot about Bush, but instead were a reflection of where the country was at the moment. So all of these legacy pieces, all of these reflection pieces about who he was as a person, we're talking about his humility, his kindness, his willingness to work with people on both sides of the aisle, his decency, his stability on the world stage. And I actually genuinely believe that all of those things were true about George H.W. Bush based on what I've read and the people that I've spoken to, but they seemed to be much more a backhanded way of referencing who was currently in the White House and how Bush was so different from that person and seemed to demonstrate this longing for a political world that no longer existed, for a Republican Party that no longer existed. And that was really fascinating to us because it was not really so much even about Bush. It was about us. And so we said, you know, is it true that this has happened before? Has there been a similar reflection in when a president has died, where the American people have had this overwhelming response that, again, doesn't really say anything about the president. And so we decided to dig into it. And uh, it turns out that that's very much the case and very much a, a common thing for us Americans to do. And so started trying to put together a volume that would contribute something to the conversation that no. contribute, you know, elements that hadn't been covered but also would be an interesting story and allow people to learn some things and tell kind of a full picture of what it looks like when the president dies from Washington to Bush. Now, you could have chosen to write this book and achieved all of those goals. Um, uh, A, why did you not, why did you believe that editing a book and gathering essays would be more effective? And then I want to ask, how is editing a book different from writing a book? Well, the main reason is that I didn't want to write it. <laughs> so okay, well, I'm being really honest. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so like I was so interested in this subject, but when we were pulling it together, I was finishing up my first book, The Cabinet. I was not in any mental place to start a new book yet. And in fact, <laughs> what I understand, um, it's a little bit of work to do your It's to write a little bit of work. Yeah. And I think I was actually in like the grindiest of grind moments, which was like I was finishing the last round of edits where I'd gone through this thing a hundred trillion times and I hated every single one of my own words and I never wanted to see any of my own words again. And I think Matthew asked me, he's like, do you want to write a chapter? And I was like, no, go away. Like I'd never want to write again, which obviously that didn't last very long. But anyway, I was in a little bit of a dark place and not really in the mood to write a book, but I was really interested in the subject. And I thought that this was a subject where it would benefit from a lot of different perspectives and from a lot of different areas of expertise because we were encompassing such a big chronological scope. And there are so many different ways to come at the question, whether it's material culture. So like, how do people buy things to remember someone? Um, How does race or party or family or gender play a role in shaping these things? And so I, I wanted to have a lot of different eyeballs on the subject and not just mine because While I think I come up with some good ideas, I think, you know, 12 people would come up with more good ideas. Um, Uh, And then you asked about the editing process. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. How how does that work? And how is the editing part different than, I mean, obviously there's an obvious way it's different than the writing, but just from a mental perspective and a, you know, content perspective, how is it different to edit as opposed to write? 
Yeah. So I think that every editor probably has a different approach to things. Uh, Matthew and I had worked together at the White House Historical Association prior to, or I guess I was still there when we started this project. And so we worked together and we had done a lot of editing work together. And so we had a pretty good rhythm down where we would split up the work and we would each take a first pass and then pass it off to the other person and they would take a second pass. And then I think that allows for more comprehensive editing. We made sure we didn't miss anything, but we also have different strengths and weaknesses. And so I think we complement each other well in that regard. And we the, bless the contributors. We, remade, we made them go through it like four times because we really wanted it to be a fantastic product. We wanted the chapters to have a cohesive organization. So each chapter does talk about the death it talks about what happens immediately after, but then it does take a, a broader picture to look at how the president's legacy and uh, the remembrance and the history around that person has evolved over time. And so we really push them to all try and have some of that similarity. Um, and then in terms of like how it challenges your brain differently, you know, when you're using someone else's words as the starting point, you don't want to take out all that is unique and special about that person's voice, but you also want the voices to be consistent enough that it's not jarring for the reader. And so it's trying to find that middle space where I'm sort of imposing like my voice as a filter on top of theirs to try and have some sort of consistency and theme throughout. And I imagine they were sometimes annoyed with me because of, ah. because of it, <laughs> but, the, um, the, that, and I will say know... the, the, the essays are really good. I mean, the essays cover a lot of stuff that most biographies don't get to because they maybe write a short conclusion or a reflective piece analyzing some of the historiography, but this really is a deep dive into the historiography. And as someone who unfortunately, or no, fortunately, has read way too many presidential biographies, um, this was a really great fresh angle, even for me. Um, and I'm comfortable saying that because I've read like 300 or something presidential biographies. Um, this was a really good fresh way to look at their lives by analyzing the way people thought about their lives after they were dead. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. We we really did want it to be interesting and new and not repetitive of work that had been repeated or we wanted it to, we didn't want it to be repetitive of work that already existed and so that it would actually tell us something new and so I'm so glad that it achieved that. Yeah, it's really great. I'm about 3 quarters of the way through. Um I just I'm in the middle of JFK now and that's what I want to ask about is how did you pick um, who you put in there. Some of them are pretty obvious selections. You know, every book on this is going to have Washington. It's going to have Jefferson, um, Jackson. It's going to have Lincoln. It's going to have FDR. It's going to have JFK. But you blessed us with Zachary Taylor and Herbert Hoover, um, Andrew Johnson. Why did you feel that was important to make sure we got quite a broad range of presidents from people who ones people who say are the very best and ones historians say are the very worst baking from our childhoods just sticks in the memory doesn't it we never set off on holiday without piles of tupperware and they'd always be bakewell slice flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot do you not do that lisa yeah, no <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Aww. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. I think we were trying to have a couple of considerations when we were piecing these together. So first, we wanted there to be chronological balance. A lot of times when you have volumes like this, they might have a token 19th century person, like they'll do Washington and Lincoln, and then everything else will be 20th century. And that's <laughs> right. fine if that's what people want yeah, right. to do. But, you know, I, I uh, by training, am an early Americanist, and I, I insist that the 18th century does count and ex it matters that it happened. And so I wanted there to be at least 19th century parity. So we wanted to have chronological balance. We wanted to have balance between people that 
like you said, the big names, the expected ones. You can't do one of these volumes on death without talking about Abraham Lincoln. It's just not possible. But we felt like if we did that, it would be so expected and it would be so sort of predictable that it maybe wouldn't be interesting or it wouldn't contribute much. And so if we included some names that were lesser known or the really terrible presidents, that would actually tell us a lot more about legacy and mourning about how do American people handle those deaths? Mm. Do they treat them the same way? Do they kind of acknowledge like, well, this person was kind of a dud as a president? You know, like we wanted to know how Americans managed that process. And so without those names, we wouldn't have necessarily been able to do so. And so, you know, I think there were a couple of, and then I should also mention when we were putting it together, we made some targeted invitations for people whose work we really wanted to include But then we also put out a call for papers to see if people would come up with interesting angles. So like, did you include any of those? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we did. So uh, for example, the Hoover chapter by Dean Koslowski. It's really good. Yeah, it is really good. It's It's fantastic. And it makes you think about Hoover in such an interesting way. I don't know that we would have included Hoover if he had not put forth such an interesting proposal. And so, you know, I think Hoover does a lot of the same things that, for example, like, a Nixon chapter would do in that they both left office in a really bad place. They really tried to rehabilitate their reputation. They didn't really succeed, but at, even though they had had this very long sort of illustrative career before the presidency, but everyone kind of thinks of Nixon and no one really thinks of Hoover. And so I'm really glad we were able to push the envelope in that way and that he had come up with such an innovative way to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to talk about some of the presidents that you put in there, and we don't have time to talk about each one, unfortunately, but we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, when you were talking about, or, or, sorry, not you, when the person who wrote the chapter on Thomas Jefferson was writing about Jefferson, and I, I didn't write the names down, I should have written them down, but it was a great chapter. Andrew Davenport. There you go, Andrew Davenport, famous uh, scholar. He's written a couple of books. Um, it struck me that that Jefferson as as andrew said he was afraid of death um but the question was was he afraid of dying or was he afraid of not being able to control his own narrative anymore well that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> um probably some of both so jefferson was a sort of notorious control freak and both in terms of his own narrative but the world that he inhabited he shaped everything about his existence to be the way he wanted it to be so everything from his house he rebuilt like three times so that it would look the way he wanted it to look he shaped the environment around him so that he would see what he would want to see and critically not see what he didn't want to see so the famous example of this at monticello is all of the necessaries the buildings that are required to sustain life like the kitchen and the laundry they are all underneath the main floor so that they're never seen by the people who they are supporting. Mm. So, and, and he was, and he would, you know, cut out people in his life if they were unpleasant. He, he just wouldn't talk about things if they were, if they were, you know, distasteful. He was so good at controlling everything about his existence. And you can't do that with death. You just cannot. There was one thing in particular that he didn't talk about at all in life. And as uh, Lindsay's making a face right now, um, yes. and as we've learned from the wonderful, <laughs> uh, yeah, the wonderful Annette Gordon-Reed, who um, shed an incredible light on um, Jefferson's, um, another part Sally of his Hemings. character that is really important for us to understand. Um, a, a quote struck me from this chapter, which is modern interpreters of Jefferson do not seek to revise history, but rather restore perspectives that were cast aside during the institutionalization of Jefferson's reputation. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to explain it. And and the way that Andrew fleshes out this story is when Jefferson died, he was deeply, terribly in debt. And the only way for the heirs of his estate to settle those debts was to sell off the house and to auction off the enslaved population to cover those debts. And so not only was it this mourning moment for the white family or the family that he had sired that was also enslaved, it was a moment of intense tragedy because it broke up and split up families and dispatched them all over the United States, many of whom never 
found their ties again. And yet when people wrote about his funeral, when they wrote about his death and the mourning around it and what happened afterwards, those individuals were quite literally erased from that story. They were not even mentioned as being present during the funeral service. And we know that they were there. And so they what were with Andrew him was when doing, he died, I mean, literally yes, with him when right he died. There. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what Andrew was doing is not revising the story. He's just taking the erasure marks and like almost going backwards in time and trying to restore that full picture. Um, there, there's an incredible line in the chapter that says, when you look at the reverse side of the nickel, the slaves aren't in the picture in Monticello. Um, I, I may never forget reading that line is incredible line. All right, let's go to Andrew Jackson. Um, in the 1950s, without a doubt, he, um, was, you know, was seen as a great president and as a great man and a modern day president at that time wouldn't have thought twice about showering him with praise, but he's a great example of someone who has undergone a total metamorphosis in our collective opinions about him. Um, today, he's even being discussed as being removed from the $20 bill. Um, that would be maybe the first time someone's been removed from our money. Although I don't know, I guess at some point someone had to be there before Andrew Jackson was on there. So we, there might, we might need a money historian for that, but, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but I digress. Um, d- does that metamorphosis in Andrew Jackson's reputation reveal more about the fifties or does it reveal more about today? Can I cheat and say both? Sure. So I think that, (laughs) so, you know, I think that for people who knew Andrew Jackson in his lifetime, they would have been a little surprised by the praise that he received in the 1950s. And that's because he was not always a particularly likable person. He could be very prickly. He was very prone to anger. He was very sensitive. He held grudges. He could be very irrational. He had very strong opinions about certain things. So like, you know, he was really celebrated for his national power stance, his rejection of nullification, his rejection of states' rights, and yet he hated the national bank. So on one hand, he was very pro-federal power. On the other, he really undermined and destroyed this this feature of the system, which was quite important. Uh, He of course, had a lot of personal elements of him that were sometimes distasteful, both to people at the time. For example, his approach to slavery, not only did he own enslaved individuals, but he bought and sold them while he was in the White House. His approach to Native Americans was uh, heartless and violent and cruel. Not that I think everyone would have complained about that at the time, but certainly some people were aware of it. And of course, he was intensely partisan. He was really the the founder of the Democratic Party in the modern two-party system. He hated the Whigs. He hated John Quincy Adams. Uh, he was not bipartisan in any sense. And so a lot of the praise in the 1950s, again, reflects what people in the 1950s wanted to remember about him. It ignores a lot of those qualities and really cherry picks the things that are useful. And yet, on the other hand... Our our thoughts about him today do the same, but sort of in reverse. We do tend to overemphasize his negative qualities, and now I would argue there are a lot of them. Uh, but I think that we are, in some ways, we're, we're trying to course correct a little bit, and so we are focusing on the negative things because values like federal power and the rejection of nullification just aren't very useful to us at this current moment. Mm. Uh Zachary Taylor is the next chapter in your book, a uh, relatively unknown president as presidents go, although I suppose they're never totally unknown. Um, the most marvelous nugget about Zachary Taylor is that he got sick mourning George Washington, literally got sick, according to this chapter, while watching the Washington Monument be built. So that is in and of itself a piece of um, uh presidential history in the way that they are mourned in a piece of historiography. But how did uh, America's, um, how did a, a president dying in office as Zachary Taylor did, how did that help the American people practice 
for losing Abraham Lincoln while in office under much different circumstances? Well, certainly the shock of the death was startling. It's always startling when a president dies in office. It was useful because it brought to mind what the transfer of power should look like, that how the vice president should come into office, that this process does indeed need to happen, that it is part of the Constitution. And anytime we have a political practice like that or a political norm like that, it has to be built up over time. So the first time is always going to be a little sketchy. It's going to be a little tenuous. It's going to be a little bit uncertain. The second time is going to be a little bit better, and it's only going to get stronger and stronger from there. So some of that muscle memory that the American people started to build was very useful when it came to Lincoln, when that was a much more tragic, much more horrific, much more devastating circumstance. Was that the first funeral train in American history, Abraham Lincoln's? Yes, Abraham Lincoln was the first president to have a, a truly national experience. So the other presidents had had people mourn them all over the place, but the body hadn't been moved in the same way. And so Lincoln, well, almost national. Lincoln's body did not go into the South. But, <laughs> right. uh, <Yeah. laughs> Maybe Lincoln's for a good body, reason. Yeah. For a very good reason. Uh, so Lincoln was first placed in the White House. Uh, he was then laid in state. He then laid in state in the U.S. Capitol. And then he went on the train and went north to New York City. There's a picture of Theodore Roosevelt as a young man watching the funeral procession uh, hanging out of the window of his family's house. And it's actually been fact checked. It is actually Theodore Roosevelt. And he later wrote about it as this defining moment in his life seeing the power and the possibility of the presidency maybe the most then, ama- maybe the most incredible picture in american history certainly one of those moments that sounds fake and yeah. makes you appreciate a sense of fate and sort of irony in history that just cannot be created by script some of these presidents have memorials now um the next one in your book is teddy roosevelt uh, well, actually, wasn't the next in the book. It was Andrew Johnson was next, but we'll skip Andrew Johnson for these purposes, for time purposes. Go and read the book; it's fantastic. The chapter was really good. Um, um, but we get to Teddy Roosevelt, and there is a one of a kind memorial to Teddy Roosevelt, and he's sort of lumped in with these three presidents from an, a much earlier time period: Washington, Jefferson, and then Lincoln. Um, Teddy Roosevelt winds up on the side of Mount Rushmore. Um, So beyond the story of how he wound up there, but it it is important. But what I really want to ask you is, how do we deal with monuments to presidents? What questions do we have to ask ourselves when we look at the Lincoln Memorial, when we look at Teddy Roosevelt on literally the side of a mountain? Um, And I would like to look at it in person one day. I've only seen pictures. But what do we have to be... um, What do we have to consider when we look at these monuments and we think about what they mean to us and to, and how they reflect on that particular president's life? It's a really good question. I think a a starting point is who put this there? When did it get put up? What was the motivation? What was the process? And what was the message they were trying to convey? And all of those questions get at this larger principle that monuments, statues, memorials, whatever, are intentional choices. And I should also be very clear that monuments are not history. Monuments are commemoration. They are specific individuals that we are choosing to celebrate in some way. And so I think the important question is, who is doing that choosing? And why are they choosing it? And that usually explains a whole lot about why the person was beloved and by whom and what was going on in society that caused them to be so important. It's crazy because when you go up, the Lincoln Memorial is my favorite. There's something about the view. There's something about the chair. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm not saying anything unique there. It's just an incredible piece of art. Um, the the names of all the states are around the top of it, which signifies our union as being one. Um, I almost feel 
lightheaded. I almost feel like my feet don't weigh anything when I walk up those steps. Is it healthy to, and this is an uncomfortable question to ask because we want to feel that way. I want to feel that way. But is it healthy for us to feel so glowing about people who are so complicated and whose administrations, no matter how good they are, even Lincoln, are not perfect? No. <laughs> I think it's oh, okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to say no, yes. Here, let me let me no, let me give you no. the nuance. Let me give you the nuance yeah. of why. I think it is okay to feel that glowing about actions, about deeds, about achievements and sacrifices. So when I see the Lincoln Memorial, I don't even really see Lincoln. I see preserving the Union and I see emancipation. Those things I think are worth celebrating regardless of the cost because of their higher value and they don't gloss over, they don't risk glossing over the flaws in the human being or allow us to forget that he indeed was a human being. So I think that when we're thinking about presidents and how we are commemorating them, we have to be really careful not to blur their greatest moments with who they were as a person. And I think the moments are worth celebrating. The person that can be appreciated and respected, but should not be glorified. Herbert Hoover and Jimmy Carter. Um, you have a chapter on Hoover. Obviously you don't want to have one. You don't have one on Carter yet. Um, the question I would ask about those two presidents, um, I felt a kinship between them as I was reading the Hoover chapter. Both of them lived for a long time after their presidencies they were not considered political successes, although there has been a rebirth of Carter um, scholarship lately that has been more favorable in how his administration worked um, and how successful it was. Um, certainly, to varying degrees, you would you know you would look at um, the political successes of the two of them. But what can we learn about how Herbert Hoover was mourned? Um, as a foreshadow for how those similarities might impact the way Jimmy Carter is born. As you said, Herbert Hoover had an extraordinarily long life and a very long life post-presidency. And he spent, and he, I should also say, he had an extraordinary career pre-presidency. He had served in multiple cabinets. He had served in Europe doling out and managing the aid to European nations after World War I with great success. In fact, he is still beloved in Europe in a way that he is not in the United States. And post-presidency, he really spent decades trying to rehabilitate the idea of a, of a market economy with little federal interference. Hoover's determination not to do much during the Depression was deeply rooted in ideology. It wasn't cruelty per se, or I, let me say, let me say that slightly differently. Some people felt that it was cruel, but it was not maliciously in, intended. It was ideologically based. He was a true small C conservative, and he did not believe that the federal government should interfere. He believed that the economy would fix itself. And so when he left office, he obviously left office in this terribly unpopular state. FDR trounced him in the election. And so he spent the next several decades trying to convince people that this conservatism should have a place in American life. He helped found the Hoover Center, which was uh, is at Stanford and is still a center for conservatives, again, small c, conservative scholarship. He advised multiple presidents on foreign policy and economic policy. And yet he could never quite get people to think of him as anyone else other than the president who hadn't done anything when the Great Depression happened. <laughs> now, I would argue Carter is slightly different. I think Carter is one of the few presidents, at least so far, based on what I've seen, that has really been able to rewrite his legacy in his post-presidential life. He's not perfect, of course, but he has shown such a commitment to human rights and peace and service and public health and has lived, I think, a life based on his own Christian principles in a way that is, is really admirable, even if they're not necessarily your principles. 
And so I think it's possible that Carter may have achieved what Hoover was not able to. Now, of course, we won't totally know until things sort of, you know, work themselves out in the next several years, but at least it seems based on the pieces that I have read and people's initial reactions that a lot of people said, you know, Carter left the presidency in kind of rough shape. He's now really admired as a really great guy. And that was not something that Hoover was able to achieve. I know so many people who have, and these are local news people, by the way, I know many more people in local news than network news. And um, I know so many people who have interviewed him and who have spent actual time with him. I mean, 20, 30 minutes at a time. It's extraordinary that he was willing to be so giving of himself and never put himself, frankly, in the way that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and Donald Trump, they live in giant mansions and they're relatively unaccessible to the American people, at least on a daily basis. Yeah. And and I think, you know, partly that's a, a deeply ingrained humility and a sense of character of who he is and, and how he was raised. I think he said in an interview that the greatest day in his life was not the day he married Rosalind or the day his children were born, but the day that his home got electricity when he was growing up because he was born into such humble origins and he never really forgot what that was like. And that's not really, I mean, even if our other presidents have really, you know, brought themselves up by their bootstraps, that is quite a statement. And so I think he never really has lost that. And and partly that's who he is. It's this commitment to service. It's this commitment to the American public. And it is, I don't know that necessarily every president has to do it, but it is very admirable. All right. My favorite thing to do with Lindsay is sort of more of a rapid fire thing. I love going through the presidents with her, but uh, in our last 20 minutes, I'd like to do a a couple of interesting, or at least I think interesting. We'll see if she thinks they're interesting questions about presidential deaths and um, her takes on some of these questions. So my first question is, which president, uh, sorry, which important or great president had a funeral that didn't match their stature? And maybe that's easy because of George Washington, right? Like he didn't want the big giant funeral, but the memorial, I think, sort of takes that away because now he just has a big giant thing. Um, Is there a great president who has a funeral or, you know, legacy that doesn't match their stature? So I will admit that I don't know a whole lot about Eisenhower's uh, funeral. That was not one we covered and I have not got, I'm actually listening to an Eisenhower biography right now on Audible, but I haven't gotten to that part of the biography okay. yet because I'm not done. Um, so <laughs> right. that would be my first, <laughs> that would be my first guess. Once you get uh, to it, it's think, over, right? Yeah, because I think that he, he was really extraordinary and uh, I don't know what the level of mourning was for him. Um, the other big ones that I think, you know, are really excellent. We did kind of cover the only one that I would, I wish that we could have seen sort of a a national reflection, which wouldn't have been possible because the technology didn't exist. But can you imagine if today Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the same day, what the nation would do? They would lose their freaking minds. So I think that that's the one that I wish like we could sort of apply modern technology to ancient events. I, I hate to say it this morbidly, but there's always a chance. I mean, there are multiple presidents out there right now. I'm not I'm yeah. just saying there's always a chance. But it wouldn't be on the 50th anniversary right. That's of right. a declaration, yes. you know. So right. it could be on the 200th or something. Anyway, <laughs> that's um, true. That would be uh, crazy. All right. Uh, do the reverse then. Which bad or inconsequential president had a funeral that was way over the top for who they were? Uh, well, we cover we cover one of them, which was was Taylor. It was pretty. I mean, partly because he died in office. Even mm. then, they were kind of like, "Oh, do we really have to do this?" He was such a boring, such a blah president. Uh, and so you can really sort of see them struggling, uh, struggling there. I think that there's a whole there's a whole slew of presidents in the 1880s that are yeah. are kind of duds. Uh, and I think that they were mourned and people are, you know, kind of forget about them. And I, I sometimes them struggle that. to remember the orders. Um, and so I think those also could probably okay. factor. In so there. have you seen the Garfield? Um, I guess it's not a documentary. I guess it's like a, like a quasi drama type thing, but they really recount a wonderful scene where they, the, the citizens build a track so they can get his special train to the sea, to the beach house he wanted to pass away at. That to me was a really emotional thing. 
of course, at the time they're watching a president die, it's a huge deal. But as time has gone on, Garfield has essentially faded from memory. So maybe that's a mismatched one, although it seems to be out of the best of intentions. Yeah, don't let the Garfield Twitter account yeah, no, uh, okay. hear you say that. They yeah. are phenomenal. Um, I think one of the things that we forget a little bit about with Garfield was everyone who lived at that time felt that he had such extraordinary potential. Um, and had he, one of the great, I think one of the great what ifs is had he not died, uh, there are, I think are decent arguments to be made that it was the last possibility that reconstruction could have survived. And so I think for a lot of people, they felt like his death was a, a real missed opportunity or a lost window where once he was gone, that that door really closed to mix up all my metaphors. <laughs> and let me say to the Garfield Twitter folks, I could not share your grief more than I, I already do because I, of course, terrible thing that happened. And he does seem like a great man in a lot of ways. I'm sorry he didn't get to be president for longer. Um, how soon after the body is cold, is it okay to start criticizing them? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. And and I actually, I don't really have a great answer to this because I have, I've been on both sides of this where I've seen criticism right away. And I've felt like, eh, that feels kind of distasteful, but then also I'm sure everyone has been at one of those funerals where the person was a real jerk and everyone's talking about them. Like they were the greatest thing in the world. And you're looking around and you're going, you are lying. You are lying. You are full of it. And, um, that's not any better. And so I don't, I don't know what the, the best middle ground is. Generally, I think I am comfortable with giving honest reflections about their strengths and acknowledging some weaknesses in the couple of weeks after with the understanding that it is commemoration. It is not trying to craft an analytical or objective legacy. And then going forward, you can try and be more objective about the history you are trying to write. This is a really hard question to answer, uh, to ask, because um, we're going to immediately think of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It's not intended to be reflective of them. If a president, if President X were killed today or died in office, would there be shared grief? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I, so you're right. My mind immediately goes to what of the what if one of the two were to die and what would happen. And I think he would be pretty partisan. I would like to think that we're still capable as a country of coming together for shared grief with if something tragic were to happen for somebody at this point in time with the way the partisan system is divided. I don't see that happening. Which grave sites have you been to and which do you like or not? So admittedly, I have not been to that many. I am going to offend a whole lot of people right now. I just, graves don't really do it for me. Um, I'm, I would much rather go to their house. I would much mm -hmm. rather see where they live because I think that tells me a whole lot more about who they You're were. You're blowing my what... next question, but okay, keep going. Sorry, sorry. That's sorry. A... Now keep going. Yeah, keep so going. I've really only been to a couple of graves and I just don't really care. I, I know that that's a mean thing to say, but I just, it's a bunch of stone. And I guess I want to know what they say on their tombstone. And then I'm just kind of like, all right, that's nice. Let's go for a walk. Um. So, but when I go to their houses, I can see what art did they choose? What colors did they like? What placement of things were important to them? What stuff did they have around? Where was their favorite place to sit? What was the view like? And is there a house really... you're thinking of now? Well, so... I think of Nixon because I've been to the Nixon house, but I've only been to a couple of presidential boyhood home yeah. type things. So I've been to a, some a lot of the older ones, the earlier earlier presidents, and I you've think been you to get Mount pretty... Vernon. I forgot that you've been to Mount, Mount Vernon, Vernon, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, Monticello, uh, Peacefield. So Peacefield is you... who? the Adamses. Ah, okay. So, Forgive me. You can, and you can see all of the Adams houses because there are technically three on the estate. Um, and I think that, I mean, these examples, Montpelier, which was James Madison's, I've been to the, uh, the, Mont the Montpelier of Henry Knox, even though he wasn't the president. 
So I think that when you see these houses, you really get a sense of who they are. You know, Monticello, you understand Jefferson's brain so much better once you see his house. If you go to Mont- Mount Vernon and you step out onto the veranda, you understand why Washington didn't ever want to leave because the view is spectacular. And Peacefield, to me, f- feels the most like sort of a cozy home. The other ones are very grand and sometimes can be a little bit cold. The older Adams houses, you see how humble they were, that they, they're they really like humble New England, super old Puritan houses. But the piece de resistance is the old stone library at Peacefield that Charles Adams had built for John Quincy Adams. And it is the most extraordinary thing that library dreams are made of mm-hmm. and where I would want to spend all of my time. Yeah. I think you've posted pictures from there, I think, right? So good. Um, <gasps> I hate talking about myself on this show because I just don't feel comfortable sometimes because I'm the interviewer, but I will talk about myself here. When I I actually like the gravestones and I love the houses, but I like going to the grave sites. Um, I feel close to them. I, I feel like... Um, I do this weird little routine when I go, which is I I try to touch as close as I can to where I can physically get to where their body might be connected by marble and dirt, by marble and dirt, and then by wood and then the body. I, I feel close to them being there. Like you go to Grant and like you touch sort of like the stone around where the coffin is and you feel like you're as close as you can be to this historical figure. Um, when I go to the Kennedy thing, you know, you sort of get as close as you can to the earth that's there and you're as close as you can ever be to John Kennedy. I just feel very powerful. I feel like that's a very powerful thing for an American to do, to go and visit their president and do something like that. Well, and I think a lot of people do feel that way. Maybe I'm broken um, <laughs> because when I go to, not I don't, yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I am. Um, I don't really feel that way when I go to grave sites, but I, I know a lot of people do feel that way and they do feel really connected. So I think, but I feel that like, so for example, I had the opportunity to record a segment on Washington's cabinet while standing in his private study at Mount Vernon. And the private study was, uh, he basically designed it based on his private study in the president's house in Philadelphia. And so it has all the same furniture for the most part, a lot of the same uh, pieces, sort of same layout, same structure. And so to stand in this room, and it was only like me and the camera guy, because it was after hours, and to be able to talk about the cabinet in his private study blew my freaking mind. And I felt way closer than I would ever feel standing at the tomb. But that's just me. Um, You know, when I... um... When I go, well, you know, let me tell the story this way. So I'll tell a story about my grandmother. My grandmother was a wonderful, amazing person. And she um, is of the Jewish faith, was of the Jewish faith. She passed away a couple of years ago. But when she would go to anyone's grave site, she had to put a stone there because that's a Jewish tradition. And it's so the dead knows you were there. And it's sort of this unmovable thing that it's a, it's a symbol, you know, that, that, that this this person is still being thought of, and it's for the, so for the people who are under there know that someone was above there visiting. We went to Alexander Hamilton's gravesite in it's probably like it was after the Chernow book because that's when I was inspired to go. But so it was you know twenty years ago now. But my grandma could not leave until she found a stone in the Trinity Churchyard and put the stone onto Alexander Hamilton's gravestone. And it was a wonderful moment. And she was like, I better not. The guards are going to come after me. I better not do it. I better not do it. And she was basically like, okay, are you ready to go? And I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. And she took the stone and threw it at the thing. (laughs) Not hard, but, you know, lobbed it at the thing. And we went and she was like running off and we went running off. And that was like her (laughs) thing of thing. They're going to come after me. They're going to come after me. I'm like, no, no, they're not going to come after you. So that's a good story. That's amazing. Um, I love that. Uh, uh, when I left a stone, not on the Kennedy grave site, but like near the Kennedy thing, a guard came in like one second and indeed took it right off of the little marble piece that's there. Anyway, um, uh, uh, if you were president, if you were a president, President Dr. Trevinsky, and you could design what your funeral would look like, 
what would you want? How would how would the President Chervinsky funeral look? So my favorite places, my favorite places of commemoration, my favorite places of reflection are those where you see as little as possible of humanity. So like, I really like the woods. I really like nature. I really like the coastline where you you're going to make the secret anything. service, bring you all the way up to the, to the, to the yonder where you walk with your dog. I see the pictures now and you, that's where you're going to make them walk. Bring Okay. Yeah, I think so. Cause the I would, really, I would horse wanna... just up the mountainside. <laughs> It'd be perfect. It'd be perfect. That's exactly right. I just, I want to go up into the mountains. I want to be with the the woods and the trees and the rocks and the things. And um, there's a great line in, I'm totally getting off track here, but there's a great line in Pride and Prejudice, which says, uh, what are men compared to rocks and trap? Is it rocks and trees or rocks and mountains? Um, and that's kind of how I feel like once we're all gone, there's still going to be rocks and trees and mountains. And I just want to be among them. Hmm. Uh, it's funny because I would probably be like right through Times Square, bring me right <laughs> through my home city. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, which presidential funeral is your favorite? Which just nailed it, which made you emotional, which makes even when you read about it, which makes you emotional. I think there are two things that really stand out to me. The first is when FDR died, there was a whole generation of Americans who didn't know what it was like to have a president that was anyone else because he had been in office for such a long time. So if you think about what your fa first political memory was, and for most people, it's usually somewhere between like six and 10, if there's a big event or if something happens, and then you add 12 years to it. So all of those people that was all that they knew. And so his death, on top of the fact that it came after the Great Depression and the New Deal state and World War II. So, I mean, talk about like smushing 10 lives into, you know, three terms. For so many people, it was just world shattering. And I think that hadn't really occurred to me until I read uh, the fantastic chapter by David Woolner in the book on FDR. The one that got to me that made me the most emotional, and I think it was the one I perhaps least expected, is the Reagan chapter, and that's by Chester mm. Patch. And I remember that um, vividly, but I was working at a national news outlet at that time, and I remember vividly that funeral from beginning to end. Yeah, and I think in, on one hand, I think I, I felt like it would be the least emotional because his death was the least surprising because he had had Alzheimer's and had been, you know, really out of the public eye and kind of already said goodbye. And something about that slow lingeringness that we've all kind of known someone that that's happened to and how sad it is to see someone who was such an extraordinary commuter, communicator and such a force and such a charismatic individual that even if you disagreed with all of his policies, if you met him, you were just so charmed by who he was for that to disappear. And then of course, anyone who watched couldn't help but feel anguished for Nancy and the family at, at the loss of that love. And so I think that that got to me in a way reading about it that I was not expecting to feel quite so emotional about. All right. At the beginning of the episode, I said, you're big in the peace world. You're always writing pieces and you are prolific. You put out piece after piece after piece. These are columns or op-eds. Um, I want to know, how do you come up with your idea for pieces? Lots of different things. So sometimes I get feisty and I get annoyed by someone and I <laughs> write something. There have been- Don't annoy her, that, everybody. <laughs> there have been pieces that have been prompted. Uh, I wrote a piece about Liz Cheney and the idea behind it initially was I was like why do you all think that she's stupid because I was reading these things on Twitter that seemed to imply that people thought she was stupid and I got really annoyed and so I wrote a piece about that um other times I will be looking at something and I'll see a historic origin that I think is not being discussed or a parallel that's not being analyzed and I feel like that's part of the story that's missing that I, I should contribute because that's not sort of common knowledge for everyone um, and then other times I I have an idea or an argument about something that I think should be discussed and it's not out there or it's maybe not really getting the attention that it deserves. And so I want to contribute to that in some way. 
And then the last one is sometimes people will just ask me questions. And um, those are sometimes my favorite because it's like, oh, I hadn't really thought mm-hmm. to write about that. And that sounds like fun. So if anyone has questions they want <laughs> answered, I'm always game to hear them. There you go. Uh, all right. Don't kill me for this. How is the Adams book going? You're writing a book. Uh, how are we doing on that? It's good. Uh, it is a tremendously fun book to write. It, how could it not be? I'm writing about John Adams. And uh, one of the main characters is Abigail Adams. And there are phenomenal villains in the story. And uh, just it's just it's so much fun. Um, I am furiously writing away. I'm hoping to have a full complete draft ready to share with editors and readers in May. And then the final needs to be done in August. So I am churning around and uh, getting there and making progress. I have lots of words written and some more still to go. Are you happy? Are you feeling good? We hope, we hope. I mean, at the moment, uh, but you know, there will come a time where I hate every word and I'm convinced it's terrible and says nothing and no one should ever read it. Uh, And surely this is going to ruin my career, Um, but I'm not there today. So that's good. Yay. Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, the author of Morning the Presidents. I, I did it. I did it again. The co-editor of Morning the Presidents. That's just a reflex. The co-editor of Morning the Presidents, Lost, Loss and Legacy in American Culture. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Check out the book. Check out the book on George Washington's cabinet, which is called The Cabinet. Also her website, lindsaytravinsky.com. She is prolific on Twitter at LM Chervinsky. I want to invite listeners as well to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axel Bank History. We update those with clips from the show guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks.